leading us in prayer, then we'll go from there. Okay, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this privilege of attending this class, of giving uh, Dr. Joel Arnold this heart for us. Lord, we pray we'll be good students of your word. Lord, and whatever Lord uh, uh, Dr. Joel is teaching us tonight, Lord, you give us understanding. And Lord, we pray we will uh, use this understanding for ministry and for your glory. We thank you and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm just going to start off here with uh, just something in, in way of encouragement. So <laughs> this, is, uh, this is just blunt, honest from what I was thinking about today. Today was a, it was a good day. I was grateful for it and I enjoyed it. But um, it was also <laughs> one of those days. There's a lot of different things came up, interruptions. Um, I have a project I've been working on for four or five years, and and um, Microsoft Word corrupted. It's like a 300-page document, and Microsoft Word corrupted it today. So I'm like, oh no. Anyway, Dropbox saved my neck. I got it all back. No data lost. We're we're back and lost nothing. Everything's fine. Um, but you know, <laughs> it was one of those momentary ah kind of things. Um, anyway, it came around to this evening and. You know how it goes. You just get to the end of the day and you're tired and so forth. And that very well may be where you're at tonight. Um, and so just 20 minutes ago, 30 minutes ago, I sat down with my family and we were looking at this, which you're probably familiar with. Um, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, aren't I? Um, so I'm going to show you a hymn in a second. And it, we were just singing this together as a family. Very, very helpful. But here's, my, here's the thought that was in my head a lot of the time today. I was thinking about theological method. Um, this project I was working on was a theological project, so I was working today on a chapter about spiritual gifts and trying to pull the information together. And um, how often are we looking at the theological information and our, our foreheads are all wrinkled up and we're, we're stressing ourselves out <laughs> trying to understand these concepts. They're, not, they're just not fitting into our heads. Um, how often in the process, and I think this is the benefit of this, this class, I hope, how often in this process do we get into the routine so much that we could start doing, perish the thought, theology, the way that an accountant just keeps his books, the way that any professional does their work. And so here we are, one more profession, and we have our tools and we go through our methods. And so if the process then of thinking about method would shake us out of the unwarranted sense of security that we've figured the method out <laughs> and help us to come back to the complexity of it, the immensity of it. Um, two things that help me keep some focus or keep some perspective. One is remembering that when I'm studying theology, I'm, what, I, what we're talking about is a person. It's, it, we're not, it's not like doing physics or something. Right? It's not like doing math. It's a, this is a person. So we are, we, are, we are learning about his works. We are learning about his nature. We're learning about his desires. We're learning about how I as a person fit into his created intentions for the universe. Um, I mean, that's just so, it's so refreshing and brings the life back into theology. It's a person we're talking about. And second is like an eschatological scope that what we're talking about now, use the First Corinthians 13 idea, now I see in a glass darkly. I mean, so it's, it's, it's like all of the days of my short existence on this earth and all of the, the work that we do with theology and every, every moment of time we have on this planet, um, we will be struggling through trying to understand and trying to wrap our heads around some of these concepts. But at the end of the day, the moment we see him, <laughs> All of that confusion is stripped away, right? And, and we see him as he is, and we are made like him, okay? And so really, a lot of what we're talking about in theological method is the process of trying to limit the spread of my fallenness and keep my fallenness out of my theology as much as possible. What we're trying to do as much as we can is recognize the areas of our blindness. What we're trying to do is put markers around so that we, we help ourselves, by God's grace we pray, help ourselves stay on track. 
when in truth my heart is like a magnet that just wants to go constantly off of the true fullness of, of what God tells us. Okay, so all of that, just thinking through uh, from this, this and where we were, what we were singing as a family, you know this hymn and it's, it's just fabulous. Oops, that's not what I was looking for. Uh, there we go. Uh, when this passing world is done, when has sunk yon glaring sun, when we stand with Christ on high looking o'er life's history, then Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. When I stand before the throne dressed in beauty, not my own, when I see thee as thou art, love thee with unsinning heart, then Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. When the praise of heaven I hear, loud as thunders to the ear, loud as many waters noise, sweet as harps, melodious voice, then Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. And anyway, just that encouragement for us tonight as we're processing, okay, we're going to talk about theology, we're going to talk about theological method. Um, all of this is the, <laughs> you can kind of use like Plato's cave. Plato was onto something with the cave, right? I mean, what I'm looking at all the short days of my life are the shadows on the back wall of the cave. And so I can do this in a theological way. Someday I will turn around and I will see the reality. Someday the faith will turn to sight. Someday the confusion will be set aside. Now I see like, as in a glass, darkly, I'm seeing a mirror. I'm only seeing a reflection. Then I will know as I am fully known. So that's extraordinary and, and ought to put a framework around the way that we're thinking about theology. Okay, plan for tonight is we have another lecture from Dr. Talbert. He's talking through this section that um, you wrote the essay on, and it's in engaging with Jesus theologizing. So he's gonna, he'll talk about that. I'll let him introduce his own idea. Um, we'll do that for the first hour. And then the second hour, I have some things planned, uh, some things I'm pretty excited about doing together. I think, I think they're gonna be beneficial. I think they're, they're gonna stretch our thinking. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. So let's do that. Let's jump in. We'll do this for the first hour. We'll finish up a little bit after when we normally finish this first part. And then the remainder of the time, we'll do some other things. Okay. Uh, if you have a question about that, shoot me a, a message in the chat. Otherwise, I'll go straight to this. Try one more time. Get the right spot. Great. Okay, let's go. Hey, this is Leighton Talbert again, and Dr. Arnold has very graciously given me a little extra time to expand on my first, on part one of my lecture. Um, with his, with 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 what is kind of a an appendix, kind of a um, lab, um, a case study um, that hopefully will work through some of the principles that we talked about and show them kind of in relation to each other. Um, you have, I think, one of the assignments that you were given was to read through these three synoptic accounts of the Sadducees' question to Jesus. You have the text there, I think, in your notes in front of you uh, in harmony form for easy access and comparative reading. Uh, Jesus' reply to the Sadducees is really a celebrated scripture text for demonstrating systematic theology in the Bible itself. The theological method of the Son of God, of course, is worth examining and emulating, especially the degree to which biblical theology guides and governs systematic theology. But Jesus is not the only one doing theology in the passage, and I'm not aware that very many, if any, have given attention to the, to the bad systematic theology uh, in this passage and what makes it bad. <clears throat> so, systematic theology is not bad, okay? But there is bad systematic theology. And Jesus' theological method is usually what gets all the attention in this passage. It's worth noting the Sadducees are also doing systematic theology, they're just doing it very poorly. The Sadducees in this passage are a good example of bad systematic theology. So, what makes it bad? Well, first, their theological predisposition 
which is a predisposition against resurrection, begins with a deficient view of textual authority. In fact, a deficient view of the canon. Um, Our sources are limited, but there is broad consensus that the Sadducees accepted only the writings of Moses as authoritative or at least of primary authority. And a flawed view of canonical scope or canonical authority, whatever form that takes, is necessarily going to result in defective theological conclusions. But as as Jesus demonstrates in his rebuttal, the Sadducees failed to grasp the full theological implications of even the portion of the canon to which they did subscribe. Or as he more bluntly put it, they simply did not know the scriptures. And one reason for their ignorance of scripture is found in a second significant flaw in their theological method, and that is that they approached the text with an anti-supernaturalistic presupposition that impacted their interpretation of even the Pentateuch itself. Luke not only includes this incident in his gospel, but he also later informs us in Acts, chapter 23, verse 8, that the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit. And yet the Pentateuch alone contains no less than 32 references to angels. So a theological method driven by presuppositions that compel one to deny or to reinterpret doctrines that are clearly and repeatedly revealed even in one's own authoritative texts. That leads unerringly to erroneous theological conclusions as well. A third flaw flaw in their theological method moves it from merely bad systematic theology to ugly systematic theology. Their theological argument against resurrection is based on pure, unfounded assumption. Inferences we looked at in the first part of this lecture, inferences are systematic theology stock in trade. Level, level two, especially level three, okay? But distinguishing an inference from an assumption can be a tricky business, especially when one's assumptions are driven by a presuppositional bias. And what appears to some to be a necessary inference may merely be a logical assumption and upon closer examination, maybe not even a particularly, lo- particularly logical one. Some assumptions are downright silly. And in this case, the assumption that drove the Sadducees' error was a uniformitarian assumption of the fundamental similarity between this life and the afterlife. I mean, why wouldn't resurrected life follow all the norms and patterns of present life, including, for instance, marriage? I mean, we're never informed otherwise, right? But their assumption that marriage in this life would obviously continue in the next life leads to the assumption that multiple marriages in this life, I mean, even multiple legal legitimate marriages, like what they are describing with the Leverett marriage, must surely create insuperable problems for any kind of post-resurrection existence. And pressing, what they're doing basically is pressing divine revelation into the scaffolding of their human reasoning and their human assumptions, and that effectively makes the theologian's imagination the arbiter of divine truth. And I've I've dubbed this ugly systematic theology as, as a step beyond bad systematic theology, primarily because the result of the first two flaws is not merely a bad theological conclusion. This bad conclusion is pronounced and perpetuated with a kind of a self-assured cockiness. They are smugly convinced that they have cornered the market on this doctrine and that there is no way around this. And the move from bad to ugly includes a further assumption there can be no solution simply because they cannot imagine one. So 
Jesus combines all these deficiencies in his critique of their theological method. And, it's, and, and, and their unorthodox conclusion when he says, you, your mistake is that you do not know the scriptures. And you do not know the power of God. You have made a serious error. I choose that translation. I just I, I like the terminology, the way it expresses Jesus' very blunt analysis of their problem. His first critique, you do not know the scriptures, highlights not only their deficient view of the canon, but also their very shallow approach even to the Pentateuch. And in his second critique, you do not know the power of God, rebukes their groundless assumption because God has the ability to overcome any imaginable problem that is, could be posed by resurrection. And both of those critiques censure, both of Jesus' critiques censure their anti-supernaturalistic predisposition because God can do anything he says and will do everything he says no matter how unimaginable it, uh, unimaginable it may seem to us. So that brings us to Jesus' reply. Many interpreters have pointed out that Jesus actually unfolds his critique of the Sadducees in reverse order. He mentions two problems, their ignorance of Scripture and their ignorance of God's power. But then he explains the second one before returning to the first. So to begin with, Jesus points out deficient theology proper, deficient theology proper leads to erroneous systematic theological conclusions. Specifically, a failure to factor in God's power inevitably produces a flawed theological hermeneutic. So we begin here with this with a correct respect for God's reliability. Good systematic theology begins with a humble and ready confession that God not only can do anything he says, but that he will do everything he says. In Scripture, God repeatedly demonstrates his capacity for you know, surprising us by finding a way to do even the unimaginable and even the unlikeliest of things that if he has promised them. A um, couple of quick examples. I mean, think of Moses' own incredulity that God could possibly deliver enough meat to feed Israel in the wilderness. Read Numbers 11, 18 to 23 and following. Um, think about 2 Kings chapters 6, 24 through 7, 20, and God's <clears throat> promise through Elisha that the bread market in that besieged city of Samaria was about to flood overnight. This is a city under siege, experiencing famine to the point of cannibalization. And God tells Elisha, by tomorrow, anybody's going to be able to buy bread with almost nothing. How is that even possible? But the man that mocked that possibility, in fact, died, right? So you've got, you've got numerous examples where God says something that is absolutely incredible, unbelievable. How can that possibly happen? And somehow an omnipotent, totally trustworthy God finds a way <laughs> to do exactly what he says. So it has to start, good systematic theology has to, restart, has to start with a correct respect for God's reliability, that he can and will do exactly what he says. This is not just a matter of merely conceding God's omnipotence. That's a doctrine the Sadducees would not have disputed. And in fact, Jesus didn't say they denied the power of God. He said they simply failed to understand it, and they failed to fully calculate it into their reading of Scripture. God's attributes seamlessly interpenetrate each other. Omnipotence is not a self-contained abstract attribute. If God is omnipotent, then he has the ability to do anything he says. And the fact that he is trustworthy means 
that he has to do everything that he says. So when the doctrine of omnipotence is applied to the doctrine of divine revelation, the byproduct is divine trustworthiness. And failing to factor in God's ability to do exactly what he says, however unlikely it may seem to us, leads to bad systematic theology conclusions. One of the fatal flaws of bad systematic theology is a tendency to underestimate God's commitment to his own words. A theologian may decide on the basis of other clear scripture that a particular passage does not mean what it seems to say, but no sound systematic theology begins with the assumption that God would be incapable of doing exactly what the text says, unless other scriptures clearly proscribe it, clearly prohibit it. Now, to some degree, granted, Jesus' argument regarding God's power also incorporates new revelation. Okay? The fact that Jesus adds previously unrevealed truth at this point, however, in no way mitigates his rebuke. That they did not know how the resurrection could be possible in spite of potential complications is really irrelevant to Jesus' criticism. We don't need to know how God could do something that he says in order to believe that God can do something exactly as he says it. But that raises another question. Does God, in fact, say that he will raise the, uh, raise the dead? And that brings us back to the first point that Jesus made to the Sadducee, Sadducees. Not only are they functionally ignorant of God's power, they are functionally ignorant of God's words as well. So, second characteristic of good systematic theology is a correct evaluation of God's word. For whatever reason, whether the Sadducees actually accepted only the Pentateuch as authoritative, and Jesus simply chose to play by their canonical rules, or whether Jesus chose to source his reply in the Pentateuch because that's where their question originated, the whole concept of leveret marriage. Whatever the reason, Jesus limited himself to the Torah in answering the Sadducees' question. But, but Jesus doesn't give any sense that he's laboring at a disadvantage here. As far as Jesus is concerned, this is as plain as the proverbial nose on their face. And for a Sadducee, that was probably pretty plain. Okay. L listen, listen to Jesus. He says, no, you are misled. You do not understand Scripture. Haven't you read? Even Moses showed that the dead are raised. You are seriously misled. That's a, a, a composite of Jesus' rebuke of them and correction of them. Nevertheless, Jesus, because, I should say, nevertheless, because Jesus draws a doctrine from a passage that everybody agrees does not explicitly state that doctrine outright, it seems safe to assume that his theological method employs some form of systematic theology. In order to evaluate that theological method, we need to understand Jesus' argument. On that point, opinions diverge, because analyzing Jesus' argument and theological method is itself an exercise in systematic theology to some degree. And there's no shortage of, uh, shortage of explanatory variations of Jesus' line of reasoning on this passage. Craig Blomberg, in the commentary on the use of the Old Testament, uh, uh, use of, wait a minute, the commentary on the, the New Testament's use of the Old Testament, and in dealing with the Matthew 22 passage, he outlines seven major options that have been put forward for understanding what Jesus' argument is here. But he concludes none of these approaches, even in various combinations, seems entirely satisfactory. So let's start with the first one, maybe what is perhaps you know, regarded as the most obvious one. Is Jesus making a grammatical deduction here? On the surface, the simplest explanation of Jesus' argument is that he rests his case on a simple verb tense. When God spoke to Moses at the bush, because Exodus 3 identifies the speaker as the angel of the Lord, by the way, I'm, I'm going to get sidetracked here, because the Exodus 3 identifies the speaker as the angel of the Lord, I personally believe that it was actually a Christophany, that it was actually the second person of the Godhead himself who spoke to Moses from the bush. 
which throws a very interesting curve into one's perception of this whole discussion, right? But I'm digressing a little bit. When God spoke to Moses at the bush, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had been, had been dead for centuries, right? And yet God did not say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but he said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, implying that they were still alive. That, in a nutshell, is the grammatical argument. Now, the grammatical argument is, is not uncommon among interpreters, and it's been around for a long time. Broadus actually traces it all the way back to Chrysostom, uh, or maybe I should say at least as far as Chrysostom. And verb tenses can, of course, carry decisive theological significance. Okay, no question about that. The question here is whether that is where Jesus leans his theological weight. And I think there are several problems with this view, that this is, this is the, 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 the crux of Jesus' argument. In the first place, there is no verb in Hebrew. He's, he's referring back to the Hebrew text, or at least to something that happened in the Hebrew text, and there is no verb. Now, to plug that grammatical hole in the Hebrew text, and that grammatical hole, therefore, in the argument, you might argue that, well, the Septuagint, which does have a present tense verb, I am the God of Abraham, that the Septuagint is what Jesus had in mind, and that that should be assumed to be an accurate reflection of the intention of the Hebrew text. But as soon as you plug that hole in the grammatical argument, water springs up from another hole, or actually two holes, in fact, because there's no verb in Mark or Luke. Both Mark and Luke bypass the present tense verb altogether. You look at Mark's Greek text, and there is, there is no, um, no I am in Mark's text. There's no I am verb. You look at Luke's text, and he actually completely rephrases it so that there is no present tense verb. So if the verb, I am, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if that's the key to unlocking Jesus' argument, then the Spirit directed Mark and Luke to put their readers at a distinct disadvantage for even being able to pick up on that. But thirdly, the statement, the present tense argument, proves only immortality. It only proves that the patriarchs had not ceased to exist. It doesn't prove resurrection, that the patriarchs would be bodily raised to life again one day. Now, all three synoptics are quite clear that the issue specifically pinpointed by the Sadducees and by Jesus in this confrontation is not merely immortality, it is the validity of a specific future event. And several eschatological um, observations, here, here we are at the level of exegetical theology, several exegetical observations bear this out. Number one, all three synoptics set the stage by spelling out that the Sadducees explicitly deny the resurrection. Secondly, all three synoptic Gospels use the term resurrection multiple times. Matthew and Luke use it twice, Anastasis. Mark uses the noun twice and the verb twice. And then thirdly, <clears throat> the grammar used in both the question and the answer points to a very specific event in a few, at, a, at a future time. The Sadducees ask about future conditions at the resurrection. And Jesus replies regarding future conditions, quote, at the resurrection and during, quote, that age. So the text is pretty clear here that nobody's talking about afterlife or immortality. They're talking specifically about resurrection as a future eschatological event. Number four, what Jesus says Moses' words prove is that the dead are raised. Again, focused on the resurrection as a specific future time event. And then a fifth consideration, Jesus, Jesus had already publicly taught the, the Jerusalem religious leadership that he was the divinely appointed agent of that future resurrection. John 5, 26 to 29. 
and the proximity of that of this debate here to Jesus' own bodily resurrection, I, this debate with the Sadducees that we're looking at, the proximity of this debate to Jesus' own bodily resurrection five days later is also significant, I think, in terms of its literary focus and theological intent. Now, neither the Sadducees' question nor Jesus' answer, then, are about whether people continue living after death, but whether they would experience a bodily resurrected existence in the future. That's what's at issue. That's what's at stake here. <clears throat> what about a logical deduction? Craig Evans sees a different line of argument going on here. Grammar and tense, he says, play no role here. The argument turns on an inference from parallel truths. God is the God of the patriarchs. He's also the God of the living. Therefore, the patriarchs, though presently dead, must someday live. Some commentators who adopt some form of this view also suggest that this was a typical style of rabbinic argument, which, while not necessarily very convincing to moderns, has to be evaluated in its own contemporary context. A third, uh, excuse me, a fourth option. <clears throat> nope, I'm one ahead. Uh, a third option, an anthropological deduction. Is that what's going on here? Some argue that the key to understanding Jesus' argument here is to recognize that the Hebrews conceived of man as an inseparable unity. Both material and immaterial, body and soul, corporeal and incorporeal. So that any implication of an ongoing existence automatically assumed bodily resurrection. And I have to concede the simplicity is appealing. Okay? Man is a material, immaterial unity, so if there's an afterlife at all, then the body has to be part of that afterlife at some point, and that implies resurrection. <clears throat> the explanation, however, never appears, as far as I'm aware, on, uh, as a standalone argument. It's always a supplemental explanation accompanying, accompanying one of these other views of Jesus' line of reasoning. It's kind, of a, it's kind of a necessary qualifier to answer the objection that Jesus' argument defends only the concept of immortality, not the concept of resurrection. So the basic reasoning runs something like this. God identified himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of the living, not the dead. If they then are living, then there must be a, com a coming resurrection since man is a corporeal, incorporeal unity. The main weakness of that explanation, in, in my opinion, is that there seem to be a number of other more obvious passages that Jesus might have appealed to, beginning with Genesis 2-7. And the appeal to God's covenantal language seems unnecessary, unless something else is going on. But from an even more basic rhetorical standpoint, if the Jewish belief in man's spirit-body unity would naturally necessitate a resurrection, then for Jesus' argument to carry any weight, the Sadducees would have to accept that belief as well. <clears throat> if the Sadducees rejected that belief, and with it immortality altogether, as we are told that they did, why should this argument carry any weight with them? In the, in the end, differentiating between afterlife in an intermediate state and a future bodily resurrection is, is it's not a foreign neoplatonic construct. It is, in fact, the teaching of Scripture. A fourth suggestion is that what's going on here is Jesus is making a theological deduction. <clears throat> And none of these really is, is a view entirely unto itself. In many cases, uh, interpreters combine one or more of these. And often it's the one that we just looked at, that um, anthropological, what I'm calling an anthropological deduction about the nature of man, the un united nature of man. A lot of commentators suggest that the emphasis of Jesus' argument falls specifically on the covenantal character of God who bound himself in covenant relationship to the patriarchs. <clears throat> and I've, I've bolded the references to covenant and relationship in the following quotes, at least I hope I have in the slides, to underscore that emphasis. 
So this basically amounts to a theological implication rather than a grammatical implication or deduction or a logical implication or deduction. So, for example, you've got uh, this statement. It's sometimes claimed that Jesus makes his argument based on this tense of a verb, a present tense rather than a past tense. God is rather than God was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is not quite right. So he disagrees with the grammatical argument as well, since neither the Hebrew text nor Mark's Greek quotation includes the verb I am. I think he's right there. In both the verb, excuse me, in both the verb is implied. Jesus' point is instead based on the reality of a continuing relationship with God by virtue of his covenant with them. He remains their God even after their physical death because of the abiding nature of that covenant. Here's another. R.T. France says the grammatical argument is too superficial an account of Jesus' reasoning. The argument is not linguistic. The argument is based rather on the nature of God's relationship with his human followers. The covenant by which he binds himself to them is too strong to be terminated by their death. Here's D.A. Carson. God is the eternal God of the covenant, a fact especially stressed wherever reference is made to the patriarchs. He always loves and blesses his people, and I'm using his people there as reference to the relationship theme. Therefore, it's inconceivable that his blessings cease when his people die. Here's D. Edmund Hebert. Jesus, Jesus held that for God to describe himself to Moses as Abraham's God, Jacob's God, and Isaac's God, did not merely refer to a past relationship that no longer existed. By his very nature, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. In calling these patriarchs into covenant relations with himself, he had established a relationship with them that was not terminated with physical death. Death did not break their spiritual relationship into which they had been brought. Here is Grasmick in the Bible Knowledge Commentary. God implied that the patriarchs were still alive and that he had a continuing relationship with them as their covenant-keeping God, even though they had died long before. And his covenant faithfulness implicitly guarantees their bodily resurrection. Here's Cranfield. The fact that Moses, the fact that in Moses' time God could still call himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob implies that at that time he still remembered and cared for them. And since he is the living, almighty, faithful God, those whom he remembers and care for, cares for must still be alive. And if they were still alive with God at, in the time of Moses, we may be confident that at the last, God will also raise up their bodies so that they may share the final blessedness. The kernel of the argument is the faithfulness of God. I'm going to point this out later, but there, if, if, you, if you read through the logical connections of that statement, there's a logical lacuna. There's a gap. How do we get from the fact that they're still alive at the time of Moses, that they're still alive with God and God's caring for them? How do we get to the confidence that God is also going to raise up their bodies so that they can share the fun? Where does that come from? What necessitates that? The kernel of the argument, he says, is the faithfulness of God. I agree with that, but, but there's still something missing to make that make sense. Here's Wessel in his commentary on Mark from the earlier edition of um, Expositor's Bible Commentary. The fact that the phrase, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, carried with it the idea of the covenant God whose promises can be relied on underscores the basic thrust of Jesus' argument, namely the faithfulness of God. Now, some of those statements of Jesus' argument are logically and the theologically stronger than others. All of them are arguing that Jesus is not reasoning from grammar or from logic, but from the theological implications of the covenantal character of God rooted in the title by which he chose to introduce himself to Moses. But again, it's, it's hard to see why a theological argument based purely on covenantal relationship, compels the conclusion of a resurrection. Afterlife, yes. I mean, he's not the God of the dead, but of the living. But, but not physical resurrection. 
And the text repeatedly specifies that the point at issue is a future physical resurrection. But what if the covenant relationship with the patriarchs includes earth-related promises to the patriarchs? And what if those promises were not fulfilled in their lifetime? And everybody agrees that they were not fulfilled in the lifetime of the patriarchs. That would create a compelling argument for resurrection. Now, I placed Cranfield's and Wessel's statements back to back and last because they end on exactly the same note, the faithfulness of God. But Wessel's statement includes an element that's absent from the others, promises. The covenant didn't merely establish a relationship. The covenant articulated specific promises. And they were promises not just to the patriarch's descendants. They were promises to the patriarchs themselves, to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. And they were promises that require physical resurrection if God is going to be a God of his word and fulfill those promises. So are we dealing here with a biblical theological deduction, what I would call a biblical theological deduction? Some commentators suggest that the linchpin of Jesus' argument is not merely the character and covenantal faithfulness of God, but the fact that God bound himself in a covenant with the patriarchs that included certain promises to them that were not fulfilled in their lifetime. I just called your attention to that, that point, that promises reference in Wessel's comment, even though I have to throw in this in, he disappointingly and I think unnecessarily opts for the grammatical explanation of Jesus' argument. He's putting his finger on a legitimate point here. In the quotations that you'll look at now, I've emphasized the references to promises to underscore this point in these arguments. And I, let me just clarify, not all of these interpreters that I'm about to quote will agree with where I'm going with this. My point will be that what they're saying logically leads to the point that I'm arguing for. But let's start with some of the statements themselves. Stein, the covenant of relationship that God established with the patriarchs and the fact that long after their death, he still identifies himself as their God indicates that they are alive and in fellowship with them. God's promises and his relationship with the patriarchs and prophets are not broken by death. Jesus argues that the promises of God are made not to the dead, but to the living. If Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are dead, then God's promise to them was limited to the duration of their earthly lives, which renders his promises finite and unfulfilled. God's word, however, cannot be bound. God would not pledge himself to the dead unless the dead were raised to life. Jesus' argument for the reality of the resurrection is based on the assumption that the call of God establishes a relationship with God, and once a relationship with God is established, it bears the promise of God and cannot be ended even by death. The relationship is the result of the power and promise of God that conquers the last enemy, death itself. Here's Daryl Bach. Jesus' argument in Matthew 22 implies resurrection since if the patriarchs are dead, the God of promise cannot be their God. The point is that the patriarchs are not dead and neither are God's promises to them. For the promises to the patriarchs to come to pass, and for God to still be their God, resurrection must be a reality. And one more from I. Howard Marshall. The argument simply asserts that God will raise the dead because he cannot fail to keep his promises to them that he will be their God. Now, the emphasis on God's promises moves, I think, to the heart of the covenantal issue. But the question we have to ask is, what promises? What promises exactly necessarily entail resurrection? I. Howard Marshall specifies his promises to them that he will be their God. Okay. Now, you might object that the eternality of God himself doesn't require the eternal existence of the patriarchs unless God specified 
that he would be their God forever. But in fact, that seems to be one of the promises of the Abrahamic covenant. I will establish my covenant between me and you, Abraham, and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. But even that promise does not compel physical resurrection. God could still be their God eternally without necessarily raising them physically from the dead. So what covenant promise or promises did God make to the patriarchs that assumes an earthly physical existence and yet was not fulfilled in their lifetime? Such covenantal promises would require their resurrection for God to be able to fulfill his word as their faithful covenant God. And the answer to that question actually surfaces in the very next verse. Also, I give to you and to your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, and all, excuse me, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Look at the highlights. God says to Abraham, I will give to you the land as an everlasting possession, not just to your descendants, to you. So, you've got, you've got three vital points, I think, to note here. <clears throat> First, the promise, trying to control my mouse here, where are you? There you are. The, the promise of the possession of the land is, is central to the covenant. Look up the references if you want, okay? The promise of the possession of the land, the eternal possession of a specific piece of geographic real estate is repeated and central to the Abrahamic covenant. Second, God promised the land not just to the patriarchal descendants of the future, but to the patriarchs themselves, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And that's a point that is repeatedly emphasized in the covenantal statements. I've got them listed here. Genesis 13, 15, all the land that you see I give to you. Genesis 13, 17, I will give to you. Genesis 15, 7, to you this land, I will give this uh, to you this land this, to, to possess, excuse me. For Genesis 17, 8, I will give to you the land of your sojournings. 26, 3, to you. 28, 4, to you. To Abraham. 28, 13, to you. 35, 12, to Abraham and Isaac. And in fact, that emphasis on the covenantal promise <clears throat> to the patriarchs themselves, personally, continues into the Exodus context, which Jesus appeals, to which Jesus appeals as evidence of the resurrection. Exodus 6, 3 to 4, Exodus 6, 8, he reminds them that he gave this land to Abraham and to Isaac, and to Jacob, not just to their future descendants. Third, the land promise remained unfulfilled in the patriarch's lifetime and therefore requires their physical resurrection if God is going to keep that promise. Now Jesus cited God's word to Moses at the burning bush centuries after all three patriarchs had died. We're not disputing their afterlife, their immortality. They are alive, but they, they died physically. And yet God introduced himself to Moses as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The title that God chose calls attention to that covenant relationship that God had established with the patriarchs. Daryl Bach, <clears throat> excuse me, argues similarly when he says the prophecy, excuse, when he says the expression God of Abraham is another way to say the God of promise. The language implies not only that they are still very much alive, that is, they are immortal, but that they must be raised if the covenant promises God made to them, made to them are to be fulfilled to them. If the patriarchs are to experience the promise, they have to be raised. <clears throat> 
and they must experience the covenant promises because God's covenant words are infallibly, infallibly reliable. The measure of God's faithfulness is the trustworthiness of God's covenant words. The patriarchs lived as strangers and sojourners in Canaan only as the land of promise, Hebrews 11.9. The promised land was promised not just to future generations, but to them, the patriarchs themselves. That's an explicit biblical theological datum. Yet they died without ever having inherited that promise, Hebrews 11.39. <clears throat> but, but death can't undo the fact that the living God bound himself to them by covenant promises that his character compels him to keep. Spirit beings neither need nor inherit physical land. How then can God be true to his promise to give them the land that he swore to give to them? The Bible's solution is resurrection. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will inherit the land that God promised them, literally and physically, because of the future bodily resurrection. Now, some interpreters come right up to the threshold of this conclusion, but they stop short of the obvious implication regarding all of God's promises to the patriarchs. Listen to I. Howard Marshall again. God will raise the dead because he can't fail to keep his promises to them. That he will be their God. Okay, granted, agreed. But why doesn't that apply to God's other promises to them? Why shouldn't the fact that God cannot fail to keep his promises not extend to his promises of the land to the original patriarchs themselves? Brian Collins, I think you heard uh, in the last lecture, correctly makes this link. God had told Abraham, I will give you the land, I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. We just saw that verse earlier. But Abraham never received this promise during his lifetime. It is this truth that lies behind, Abra uh, behind Jesus' affirmation that Exodus 3.6 teaches the resurrection. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because he has covenanted with them. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, because the patriarchs must be raised one day for the promises to them, and he's referring here to the land promises, to be fulfilled. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob precisely because he entered into covenant with them. And a covenant entails promise. And a promise entails an obligation. When somebody makes a promise, Blazing writes, they're not just stating something, they're doing something. They are forming a relationship and creating an expectation that carries moral obligation. One of those promises was that, that the patriarchs themselves would possess a piece of land that God repeatedly defined with geographical specificity. God can always give them more than he promised, but he can't give them less or other than he promised, not, not, and, not, and be a God of his word. Nor can he give to others instead what he promised to them. So at its most basic level, Jesus' argument for resurrection is grounded in the inviolability of God's covenant promises to those with whom he covenants himself. Now, let me just pause and clarify. <clears throat> I think all of this is a very strong argument for dispensational theology, specifically in regards to the Jews being restored to the land that God promised to give to them. That's a separate issue. What we're dealing with here is that this whole covenant relationship and the promises at the center, at the core of that covenant relationship, for those promises to be fulfilled, there has to be a resurrection. That's what Jesus is arguing, and that's what I'm arguing for here. I think, again, that that the argument extends further to a, a little bit of a broader dispensational perspective. But what Jesus, what I'm, what I'm arguing that Jesus is arguing for is that this is an argument for resurrection specifically. Now, let's turn then to Jesus' theological method. Several key strands of this pericope uh, 
are essential for an accurate evaluation of Jesus' theological method here. The Sadducees specifically denied the resurrection. The Sadducees' question, secondly, was not about one's postmortem condition. It was about an explicit event in the future at the resurrection. Jesus' answer was not about one's postmortem condition. It was about an explicit event in the future at the resurrection when they rise from the dead, that age and the resurrection of the dead, <clears throat> and concerning the dead that they rise and that the dead are raised. I'm just I'm plucking out all of Jesus' statements that indicate that he's talking about a specific eschatological future event, the resurrection. These contextual details are, are the guardrails that are necessary to keep one's explanation of Jesus' explanation and Jesus' conclusion on course. He's not making a systematic theological argument based merely on you know, a grammatical inference. His argument is an essentially systematic theological conclusion in the sense that he is inferring a doctrine that is not explicitly stated in the text that he chooses. But he's in the process modeling systematic theology at its very best. A systematic theology conclusion inferred on the basis of both explicit and implicit biblical theological data, grounded in exegetical data in connection with the title and its covenant implications. And I would summarize it this way, Jesus' argument this way. <clears throat> the covenant relationship that God formed with the patriarchs requires resurrection so that he can fulfill the covenant promises that he made, not just to their seed, but to them. So Jesus is not hanging from the slender thread of a single semantic datum, the entire weight of a doctrine that is not also expressly taught elsewhere. This is taught all over the place in the Old Testament. Remember, he could have picked, he could have picked a number of passages from the prophets or from the writings to argue for resurrection. They cite the Pentateuch, they hold to the Pentateuch, so he sticks to the Pentateuch. So what Jesus is arguing here is not the whole argument for resurrection, but it is a perfectly valid, legitimate argument on the basis of a text that the Sadducees can't possibly impugn. So the, 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 the theological method that he employed in answering the specific question from this particular text is both adequate and sound. It is a systematic theological inference, the doctrine of physical resurrection, based on biblical theological implications, like God's covenantal relationship with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which also, biblical theological data, includes promises to them personally that have not yet been fulfilled, grounded in excuse me, exegetical theological data, such as God's chosen title as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He didn't have to introduce himself to Moses that way. He chose to. And other data like texts that specify God's promises to the patriarchs personally, and not just corporately to their descendants. So all of that is combined in this conclusion. Now, Jesus does not, of course, make all these connections explicit, but that's true regardless of your explanation of Jesus' argument here. That's true of any of the other arguments for what Jesus', is, is, what Jesus line of reasoning is here. But to reference God's title as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is to reference the covenant relationship, and the promises are the covenant. The covenantal promises to the patriarchs are the very reason, in fact, they're the only reason, that God even appeared to Moses in Exodus 3 and commissioned him to lead the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob out of Egypt. And that's the passage to which Jesus turns in response to the Sadducees' proposed dilemma about what will happen at the resurrection in order to prove specifically that the dead are raised. And to avoid, you know, a kind of textual, historical tunnel vision, it is, again, I'll remind you, also helpful to remember that Jesus had already taught the Jerusalem religious leadership publicly that there would be a resurrection and, the, and that he alone was, was God's authorized agent of that resurrection <clears throat> back in John 5. And in fact, only weeks before the Sadducees contra Sadducee in controversy, he bolstered Martha's confidence 
in Lazarus's eventual future resurrection with the stunning assertion, I am the, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, that was privately to Martha, as far as we know. But the other was very public teaching in John chapter 5 that was, you know, on record before this late in Jesus' ministry, uh, this, this controversy arises. Now, how does, how does Jesus' clinching statement, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him, that's Luke 20, 38. How does that clinching statement relate to this line of reasoning? The Net Bible note on Jesus' conclusion in all three synoptics states succinctly, quote, Jesus' point was that if God could identify himself as God of the, of the three old patriarchs, then they must still be alive when God spoke to Moses. And so they must be raised. And again, like, like so many other um, arguments that we've seen, so many other expressions of these arguments that we've seen, the explanation stated here labors under a logical, uh, a logical lacuna. Why must they be raised just because they were alive when God spoke to Moses? Why does the patriarch's ongoing personal existence after death logically demand bodily existence at a future, quote, resurrection? The link between those two posited statements, they must still be alive, I'm talking about the Net Bible statements, they must still be alive, therefore they must be raised. The link between those two statements, both of which Jesus argues are true, is the nature of the covenant between God and them. That's the link, the nature of the covenant, the covenantal promises that exist between God and them. But even God's eternal covenant to, God, to be God to you, Genesis 17, 17, does not in itself demand future resurrection unless some aspect of that covenant requires their resurrection. And the only aspect of that covenant that requires their resurrection is a specific promise repeated explicitly to the patriarchs themselves that was not fulfilled in their lifetime, the inheritance of the land. And God can't lie. So they have to be resurrected if he's going to be able to fulfill that promise to them. Even Abraham understood the necessary connection between resurrection and another one of God's covenant promises. This is Hebrews 11, 17 to 19. Read that passage as the explanation of Genesis 22. What, 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 what the writer of Hebrews is arguing is that Abraham reasoned this way. Because of God's inviolable promise that Isaac would be the one to perpetuate his line, Abraham logicized. The verb in Hebrews 11.19 is logizomai. He reasoned, he concluded, he logicized that the sacrifice of Isaac could not possibly be the end of Isaac, even if it meant that God would have to do something totally unprecedented, like raise him from the dead. Abraham's willingness to imagine an outcome as necessary in order for God to keep his word, even when that outcome entailed an experience for which he had no precedent, no revelation, it is an astonishing lesson to theologians. God will always do exactly what he says. That's what Abraham is banking on. God said, Isaac is the seed. This can't be the end. If I kill Isaac, God's going to have to raise him because God can't break his word. So Jesus' final statement is not merely a generalized principle. It's a very specific application of purposeful terminology. The transition from God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob to we're back in, in the synoptics here, to the God of the living perpetuates the covenantal title and the covenantal relationship that God bears to all those with whom he is in covenant. After all, I mean, you've got other passages that assert his universal deity. Numbers 16.22, Numbers 27.16, Jeremiah 32.27. I mean, that he is God of everyone. He is God of the quick and the dead. He's going to judge the quick and the dead. He's God over the living and the dead. So in an absolute sense, absolute theological sense, he is the God of the dead, even though Jesus says he's not the God of the dead, he's God of the living. 
Jesus is making a very specific, narrow point here. Not in the covenantal sense of that title. In this context, is God the God of the dead? In an absolute theological sense, yeah. But we're talking covenantally. We're talking about a very specific context. In this covenantal sense, God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. Jesus is clearly making a much more specific point here about the nature of those with whom God hears a uh, with whom God bears a covenantal relationship. And if God has become someone's covenant God and if that relationship if that covenant relationship includes promises that God can't fail to uh, fulfill <clears throat> then he's got to do something to fulfill them. If those promises are of an earthly, physical nature, and they remain unfulfilled in that person's lifetime, then God can't fail to fulfill them, even if it means, just like Abraham reasoned, Hebrews 11, 30, uh, 11 19, even if that means raising them from the dead. And that's the whole point in the controversy. That's Jesus' whole point here. So it's not surprising that many other scriptures go far beyond the implications of Exodus 3 to declare the certainty of a future resurrection. But Jesus' argument, Jesus confines his argument to Exodus 3. So the connections justify the conclusion. The specific text Jesus cites never states a doctrine of resurrection. And yet his inference silences his critics and astonishes the crowd. Even some of the scribes are impressed by Jesus' argument. Well said, teacher, Luke 20, 39. The original audience clearly understood it to be a valid conclusion. The remarkable use that Jesus makes of God's words here demonstrates their trustworthiness even down to implications that are not directly stated in the text. Now, let me end with a final application to the relationship between biblical theology and systematic theology, which is what this whole lecture is about. This will take about a minute and a half, maybe two minutes. Is, 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 uh, is my understanding of Jesus' theological method, and I put this up there for you to see. I hope you can see this. I think you can, because it's a lot to read through without you being able to see it. Is my understanding of Jesus' theological method the only rational, definitive conclusion to come to about what Jesus is arguing here? Well, that depends on who you ask. Okay? If you ask me, I think so. In my opinion, well, I, I, I don't know that I would say it's the only rational, definitive conclusion, but in my opinion, it's the view that makes the most sense of the most data. Okay? Will everyone agree with me? No, clearly not. Everyone is not only doing some systematic theology to try to understand Jesus' method here, but everyone is also bringing some of their own systematic theology to that task. Most covenant theologians do not look favorably on the argument that the land promises must be fulfilled in their original geographic specificity. Even though some of them argue with me that God's faithfulness to his promises is at the root of Jesus' point, other systematic theological considerations, and, and they would argue biblical theological considerations, shape some of their previous commitments to the, and, to the, and, and the extent to which they are willing to apply their own arguments. Dispensational theologians would not have a problem with much of my basic argumentation, though some of them may still not agree with me uh, with my conclusion about that this is really the, the point of Jesus' argument. But as we work in the inextricably related disciplines of biblical theology and systematic theology, what's important is faithfully and honestly trying to let the exegetical biblical theological data drive our systematic theological conclusions, especially in those areas where the text itself does not give explicit answers. So... My, my concluding exhortation to all of us, make sure your theological method privileges the text, incorporates all relevant biblical theological data, considers related sound systematic theological findings, and finally respects those who come to different conclusions from you. Thanks for listening. Okay. Great. Um, we'll take a break in just a second. Um, I'm going to just say this again, like I did last time. I would encourage you, if you will,
just to shoot him a note because he wasn't able to be here with us personally, directly. Um, I'm putting his email here in the chat. And so, I, I mean, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to spam him, but if you just, if you shoot him a note to say thank you and express your appreciation for his time, um, he put a lot of time into these, as you can tell. Okay, so I've got um, 11 minutes after the hour. So let's come back in five minutes. So I'm looking at 16 minutes after the hour. Um, here's my, well, it won't be 16 minutes out after the hour because I'm going to tell you some things. Here's my plan, and I, I'm saying this so that your mind can start thinking. Um, I want us to think about these branches of theology, the, the five branches of theology that we've discussed here. And in specific connection to a specific to a question that I was working through today, um, infant baptism. So I, I don't believe in infant baptism. I'm a Baptist. Um, but I was reading a very good systematic theologian today who argued for it. And I didn't agree with his arguments. And that's some of what I was working on. My question here is, can you come up with, if you're just going to, I just picked something, but if you were just going to pick an area, a question, should I baptize my infant daughter, who's uh, still very young? Um, should I baptize my infant daughter? I would be looking for you to give me an argument from each one of these five areas, historical, exegesis, biblical, systematic, practical. And actually, in order to challenge us a little bit, I would be asking you to give me an argument, this would be painful, but give me an argument in favor of infant baptism and against it. So if you were going to argue for infant baptism from one of these five areas, how would you do it? And I have a specific thing in mind for each one of those five, as well as an answer or an argument that comes back against infant baptism from each one of those five. Okay, so someone who does believe in infant baptism has an exegetical reason that he thinks that's true. I don't agree with his reason, and I'm not saying you need to, but what would be a reason he might give? What would be a reason or an argument he might give from biblical theology? What would be a reason he gives from systematic theology? What is an answer you would give him back from systematic biblical exegesis, so on? Okay, so <laughs> you can do all that during the break in the next five minutes. Not really, but we'll come back. We'll talk about some of that. And you can think about some of that as we go. Okay, so now I've got 14 minutes after. I'll see you at 19 minutes after the hour, five minutes from now. Thanks. See you then. A little bit. Um, what I wanted to do here, just given the way that this lecture was broken up, is use this in a way that connects with some of the things Dr. Talbert talked about and even connects backwards with some of the things that we had talked about before. And what I'm trying to do here is connect all of the parts of theology, these five methods that we're talking about, try to connect them together. Where I'm ultimately going, just so you know the flow of my argument, where I'm headed here is an argument that each one of these methods is a different guardrail or represents a different concern and a different help to keep us on track so that to stay on track, you have to have all five of the methods. That's a fairly obvious thesis, but I wanna to try to illustrate that and work that out in a couple of ways. So I wanna start here with a concept um, that I'm hoping you're familiar with already, but no worries if you're not. It's the concept of the spiral. Uh, the concept of the spiral has become really important with the recognition that you don't just reach truth by simply a linear way, okay? but it's the reality that you struggle through different concerns or different considerations as you're trying to reach truth or as you're trying to reach the core, the, the, the place you're going to understanding. Um, this is an idea that comes up in hermeneutics and the idea in hermeneutics goes, you cannot escape your own subjectivity. So I have a background, I have um, things, people I've known, relationships, and you know a place where I studied and things like that. And a culture, all of that shapes the way I think. So how can I possibly ever come to a place of interpreting a text correctly? And the answer is I'll never quite get there, but you kind of end up spiraling around. Let me show you what that looks like if I'm doing this in terms of theology now. Okay, so I'm doing this again with the spiral, but I want to show you 
attention, maybe with a specific question. So let's take this question. Dr. Casillas gave us once a really helpful discussion of the law. And let's try that with the law. Maybe in the process of trying to understand the believer's relationship to the law, I might find myself on these two extremes. Okay, let me di explain my diagram first so you understand what I'm doing. On this side is the extreme, the wrong extreme. Old Testament believers were saved by law. On this opposite side is the extreme. The law is our enemy. So over here, you're giving too much of a role to the law. Over here, you're giving too little of a role to the law. The law is negative. It's almost bad. Okay. Now, the concept of the spiral would go, you're, you're kind of bouncing back and forth between those extremes. So you start out thinking that Old Testament believers were saved by law. Somebody corrects you. No one has ever been saved by law. And so they show you, based on Paul's argument in Romans and so forth, no. Um, so they're taking you through these kinds of passages in Galatians and Romans to demonstrate this, and you come out on the opposite extreme. Okay, never mind. The law is our enemy. Uh, we can be grateful that the New Testament freed us from law, and so now the law is a bad thing. Okay. Well, then someone brings you back around to recognize that on the other hand, no, actually, the New Testament talks about the law, law in an authoritative way. So maybe you're swinging back around, gives you theological whiplash, but you're swinging back around to recognize this on the opposite extreme. Okay, Old Testament and New Testament believers relate the same way to law. What happened here? You're a little bit closer. Old Testament believers were saved by law is just an awful view. You came in a little bit. Old Testament believers relate the same way but you're still off. And somebody points that out to you. And so now you swing around to say, New Testament believers are not under law. That's better than the law is our enemy. You're coming in a little bit. You're making progress, but you swung around the opposite side. Okay, that might swing you back around. The entire law is still authoritative, closer to truth, but still off. We are under the law of Christ, not the Mosaic law. Okay, still getting there, uh, but you're coming back. This I put this in the middle. Maybe it, it should be up a little bit. Christ fulfilled the law so that we can obey it. Great, yes. But you're going to keep on. You're going to keep on orbiting, swinging around and around as you're kind of zoning in. Okay. So the concept of the spiral that helps me anyway is I never, I never reach it in the sense of I have now come to truth and I'm done studying. I'm done struggling. I've never settled the question entirely, and I can just put that one aside. But you're always constantly trying to sharpen your understanding. And, and therefore, as you read your Bible and you go through it the, the 29th time, you come across some passages that actually confront your theory or your assumptions in a fresh way. And you have to go back and understand in a fresh way. And you get sharpened again. That concept of the spiral helps me because it's forcing me always, 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 I'm, I'm having to keep on pursuing. Uh, a couple of just um, observations about this. Um, this fits the complex nature of reality. Reality isn't simple. Okay, so it, let's, I don't know. I mean, we could take like a political discussion and one group of people thinks they know the way that the country ought to solve a problem, and another group of people has another set of arguments for their way. Uh, what's the truth? Like, what's the answer? And you realize about these political debates, there's not really going to be, this is it. You're going to have to weigh that. You're going to have to weigh that. There's going to be some of, right? Okay, philosophy. It, we've been doing philosophy, people. have been doing philosophy for 3,000 years. And some people argue that we've made no progress <laughs> because we've not really answered any of the questions in a finally completely settled way, right? Okay, so if that's true then, of something as, I'll say it this way, rel as relatively simple <laughs> and manageable and easy, something so easily reductible as politics or philosophy, what I just said won't make sense till I put on the last piece of this, how much more God? In other words, politics and philosophy is mind-bendingly complex, but it's nothing. And this, this is like the simplest of machines next to the infinite God, right? 
So when I'm coming to theology, which is the discussion of him, his nature, his works, and how I fit into that, I should expect that it's going to go beyond then my capacity to simply settle it. Um, that's why John Frame talks about, or John Frame Vern Poitras will talk about multi-perspectivalism. You come to a question and you have to look at it from a lot of different angles to get the whole vision. Or um, I think this is Poitras says polysymphonic theology. And his idea of that is theology ends up having multiple different, um, multiple different strands to it. And you have to pay attention to all of those strands and look at it from all of those angles to get the full picture. Okay, reality is complex. And that means that you're always moving towards the middle. However, here's the, here's the process or here's the part of the benefit of that model is that at the same time, there is legitimate progress. So in other words, I mean, the argument here goes, the, the progress of understanding is not simply just a straight line. It's not that simple, it's not that easy. It's going to end up being uh, revolving around, and yet as you're kind of struggling between that extreme, no, not that, that's too extreme, no, that's too extreme. Okay, as you're struggling around that, you are making progress to somewhere. So you may be struggling with this and that, and not quite sure how they fit. You may be not being not able to just fully and completely establish the question for all time and eternity, but you can move somewhere. You can make progress. Okay, and then one last observation out of this. Um, a final argument I would make here. I think most people get stuck somewhere here around this, this spiral. Most people, maybe all people, <laughs> We get stuck somewhere around here, meaning as we're revolving around this dynamic, somewhere in here we hit an answer that is sufficient to us or sufficient for us for our purposes, and we just stop there. And, and to stop there then, to stop asking questions, to stop struggling, or to stop bringing information in that challenges my view is to stop growing. Now, here's the reality of it. Um, this is why I say, maybe, you know, some people get stuck, probably all of us get stuck. <laughs> the reality is there's only so much time to ask questions. And there's so much stuff to study and learn that you can't go that deep on every question. Okay? So there's a thousand different things you would like to learn about, and you just have to pick. And that's going to be true in theology as well. So it is actually true <laughs> that at some point, on a specific question, we could do that. The role of the Christian to relationship of the Christian to the law. At some point, you've gone as far as you can go, maybe in this lifetime, or at least until today. And you say, okay, I've got to, you know, I've got to go to bed now. <laughs> I've got to, I've got to live life. You go as far as you can go. So to say we get stuck is not necessarily um, a complete cessation of thinking. It's just I'm just arguing, let's keep on struggling through the questions. Let's keep on pushing there. Okay, um, Joseph Ng had a, this is a good question. Is there a danger of confirmation bias towards the mean in the middle? And that's a great question. Uh, let me answer that way, that's this way. Um, there's an old, very old intellectual pattern. Um, if you have, like, here are the views, here's this extreme, here's this extreme, and so you present, here's the five views or whatever. Everybody, everybody wants to be view number three. <laughs> you want to be the view in the middle, right? Um, and I would caution against that. Just because this is the spectrum of views doesn't mean that that's the right one, the one in the middle. So if I surveyed the perspective of views on, I don't know, you know, the, the gay agenda in 2020, well, I'm like way out on the far sideline of that. I'm not going to be view three right in the middle, right? I mean, there's, I can, I, you could create a list of a thousand things like this where we're way out on one extreme and that's the place you want to be. Um, so I, I think that's maybe just the caution. I don't mean by this concept, the spiral, that the middle between the extremes views is the view want, you want to go for. What I mean by this is as you struggle with the information, the information seems to pull you this way Pull you that way and struggling around that ends up a lot of times forming into something of a spiral.
Um, okay, great. I'm going to keep on moving. I don't want to get, because I, I use that as an example. I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of just exploring that. We have a lecture from Dr. Casillas on the, the Christian's perspective on the law, so I commend that to you. I'll drop that in the chat later. Let me do this, though. Here was the next concept I wanted to put into that. Um, if these then are the questions, or if, if that's kind of, what am I arguing, kind of the framework or the dynamic that tends to happen as we pursue answers to a question, how about this as the set of questions that push us inward? Okay, so what you saw with the diagram, and I'm, I'm not showing you the questions yet, um, what you saw in the diagram was the spiral and then you're kind of swinging further and further in because something's pushing you inwards. Some set of questions, some set of information is pushing you inwards. Um, what if the set of questions or the set of, what do you say, the set of concerns could be this? What if we could view each one of the theological disciplines as expressing a specific set of concerns or a pattern that we're recognizing in theology? that's driving us, kind of keeping us handrails, or guardrails is what I'm actually wanting, guardrails to keep us on track. So let me talk about what those things would be. First of all, uh, let's start with exegetical theology. The text of scripture is the final seat of authority, right? And so you, you can't, the concern of exegetical theology would be that you can't use predominantly, um, let's say, practical concerns. Well, this will work, this will help people in order to confute and set aside what scripture actually says. Moving upwards in that chain, uh, scripture defines its own questions and categories. Okay, so what I'm doing here is kind of contrasting with systematic theology, where systematic theology is, you came up with a question, well, let me try to answer that. That's good and that's useful and it's necessary. But there are times when I need scripture to set the category. I need scripture not just to give me content that I put into my slots. I need scripture to define the slots. I need scripture not just to be the content that is the, the, um, the filler underneath the headings, but I need scripture to also define for me the headings. What are the chapters? What are the questions I should be asking? And it's the recognition that sometimes questions and or categories for organizing our information also contain information. So that if I strictly stay over here with systematic theology and I strictly allow the asker to define the questions or I strictly allow the author, the human author, meaning me, you, John Frame, a person like that, to come up with the categories, some of those things will be skewed. And somewhere in here, I ne need to let scripture speak and define its own organization and categories. Okay, that's the benefit of biblical theology. Another benefit I could put in here would be just a limitation. There are some questions to which the answer is bad question. Next question, please. Systematic theology though. The benefit here is the recognition that all of scripture coheres, okay? That scripture does have answers for the questions that we face in the world and in life. And all of scripture speaks with one voice so that I can take a statement from Genesis and a statement from Revelation, combine with them with a statement from Malachi, and it has one author who spoke, and it all coheres. It's one word. Um, I'm gonna to skip to historical theology. Historical theology learned from the mistakes of the past. I thought about this and maybe this could be said a little better. I like that, I like mistakes specifically. That the benefit of historical theology in my understanding is not so much, well, this is traditional, therefore we ought to do it. But it is for us to look back and recognize, okay, they tried this, but it didn't go well. <laughs> and that turned into this wrong idea, let's beware. And finally, practical theology. Um, Practical theology would be another guardrail. Let's just say if you are articulating ideas, if you're communicating concerns, theological concepts and so forth, and this is creating in people's lives all kinds of disorder and ungodliness, you might wanna go back 
and make sure that you're actually basing your thoughts on scripture. Right? We don't strictly speaking define our theology in pragmatic terms, but we are Titus and the other pastorals. We are expecting that right theology produces right living. And so a theology that would tell people to do things that is clear that are clearly unethical, that's a bad theology. I'm done or even a theology that produces that fruit in people's lives. Okay, I don't know if that kind of framework is helpful. My concept of it goes, though, each one of the methods then has a concern, a legitimate concern. And that legitimate concern, as I'm kind of navigating this spiral, as I'm struggling through the questions, each one of those concerns pushes me in. Well, wait a minute, consider that. And these are legitimate concerns pushing me in, directing me, and ultimately they're going to help me better to reach a complete, robust, and thoroughly accurate understanding. They're going to get me closer to the center. If I took my diagram just a moment ago, well, I'll just put it back. If I took this diagram and I just cut out one of these areas, then you can recognize that something's going to be imbalanced, right? And if I cut out multiple of them, it's just all the more so. So each one of these has a legitimate concern that helps me stay centered, helps me stay on track. Okay, um, the next thing I wanted to do, because I, I want this very much to be something that we can do practically, that we can, um, we can see where this goes and how this works. So I'm gonna break us out into breakout rooms and the name of your breakout room will be the area or the branch that I'm wanting you to think about. Okay. So when you go to your breakout room, you'll just look at the title of the breakout room. Somebody will be in exegesis, okay? Well, when you get there then, um, then I'm asking you as a group, and I set the time for five minutes, so it's gonna go fast. For five minutes as a group, if you can pick somebody who will be like your secretary and just write out, discuss a little bit from practical, or ex I said exegesis, from exegesis, what would be an exegetical argument it would be going for infant baptism and then what would be an exegetical argument going against it okay and as i said earlier i, I i'm very much very much um convinced that infant baptism is a bad idea <laughs> and i think most of you are as well i'm just asking us to think through work through what would be an argument somebody makes exegetically for it exegetically against it okay so I won't take time when we come back for us to say that verbally because that can kind of expand out. I will ask you to write up your findings um, in the next five minutes or so. Write that up and then when you come back in, just drop it in the chat and we'll talk through what you find in the chat. Okay, any questions there? Um, drop it in the chat real quick because <laughs> I'm about to send you out to those breakout rooms in a second. All right, great. Three, two, one. <laughs> Um, so let me move. I'll switch this over to that in just a second. And you can just have a discussion for a couple of minutes. And then in five minutes, you'll just come back in. One that came in. Uh, historical theology, the reformers, even Anabaptists at first practiced infant baptism. Uh, on the other hand, Baptists and dispensationalists practiced immersion and were against infant baptism. Great. Um, so I have a friend that baptized his daughter, I think last year. He's a good guy, loves the Lord, studying theology. Uh, like I said earlier, I'm, I referred to a theologian. It's John Frame. Okay, I really like I mean, John Frame has been very helpful to me in so many different ways. So I read that today, and it's in his systematic theology. He's arguing for infant baptism. Um, so the, one of the arguments these guys will make is, well, way back, I mean, ancient traditions, we can find that infant baptism was happening. So how can you say that it's a bad idea? Um, and I would say there's a very good counter-argument, historical theology counter-argument for that. My form of that would go, okay, that is true. It's a fact. It has happened. It has happened all the way back in early, early church history. How's that turned out? And the answer, if you're asking yourself, how did it go when we've done this, 
The answer is not very well. Okay, so you can look at the history of like the halfway covenant, or you can just, you can look at Lutheranism. I have family that, um, I have family that died Lutheran. And at the funeral, the explanation of the funeral was, well, this person was baptized as an infant. And so she's okay. She's going to be okay. It's not gone well. Okay, so I have a historical theology argument for me would be don't just ask what did they do, but did it help them get to a good place or a bad place? And I think the answer is generally a bad place. Um, I think, Brother Kenneth C., you must be doing exegetical. Is that right? Your group was exegetical. So Genesis 15, God made a covenant with Abraham. Uh, no, <laughs> biblical theology. Um, God made a covenant that was sealed with a sign of circumcision. And so God promised to bless Abraham as offspring, that he would be God to Abraham and his children. Okay, so the argument here generally goes that circumcision is parallel to um, baptism in the New Testament. Okay, and so you can do some things like that. I would call that a biblical theology argument. So, um, yeah, and the counter biblical theology argument would be to pay attention to the, just the discontinuity between the Testaments. And there is a strong discontinuity. Um, Brother Jun Gonzalez, I'm wondering if you are uh, doing the exegesis argument. Um, sometimes people will argue for exegesis based on the fact that in Acts, you see whole households that are baptized. And so the assumption goes, maybe there were babies in those households. I would find that a very unconvincing argument. Okay. But that's an argument that they make. My counter argument to that would just go, when I look at the word baptize and I see the pattern, the pattern is belief. Okay, so that's my exegetical argument. Um, I'm not seeing the other groups come in here and that's, that's uh, allowed. But um, here, I'm gonna skip for sake of time. I'll jump to practical. What would a practical argument look like? A practical argument, someone could say in favor of infant baptism, well, we want families to view themselves as part of the church together. And so the entire family comes in together as worshiping. We are together as a family members of the covenant community. Okay, and so they have a practical concern. Uh, we want this child to view himself as part of the covenant community from the very beginning. Um, my practical concern, pushing back, would be I do not want my daughter, who's an infant still, I do not want her coming into uh, self-consciousness assuming that she's a Christian or a halfway Christian or a 20% Christian. I want my daughter to know that she is absolutely on her way to hell without Jesus. And she has absolutely no special advantage because she grew up in my home in terms of if she does not accept Jesus Christ personally. Okay, so I'm desperate to convince her that she's a heathen, <laughs> that she has no special advantages by virtue of her last name or her affiliations. So that would be a practical argument going back. Okay, so arguments in each one of these, I'm trying to do that to illustrate, I hope what that looks like in the framework to say, looks like I dropped there's practical theologies back, to say that each one of these concerns pushes inward and leads you to the conclusion you're wanting to get to. Okay, uh, last thing, we're basically out of time. But last thing I would like to look at with you is um, based off of the question that was asked last week, or last time, I don't remember. But someone asked, so should we start teaching people exegesis early on? Should we start teaching them biblical theology? Or, you know, where should we start? Basically, where should we start in helping people? as we're trying to help them study the Bible. So here's what I wanted to do, and I'm trying to give this to you as an attempt, help us to think practically through some of the questions and how we can help people with theological, theological method. Um, my contention, my underlying assumption here is a framework for theological education, that theological education is not just a thing we're doing, it's not just a seminary thing. Theological education is not just for Bible colleges and so forth. Theological education is what I do when I sit down with my five-year-old and I talk to her about the Bible. It's just a slightly different form. It's on a different level. But talking to my five-year-old about the Bible is theological education, and we just layer that as they grow. Okay, if, under my contention earlier, all of these disciplines push inward inward, 
towards a central concern where I need all of the disciplines to like guardrails keep me on track if that's true and that's true on a doctoral level or that's true even on a master's level or a college level I need all of the disciplines to keep me on track that's true all the way back to my five-year-old so what are some of the practical things then that I mean what well I'll say this I I am conscious sometimes talking to my five-year-old I'm saying something to her and I'm thinking, yeah, this is basically biblical theology. Or I'm talking to her explaining a question or we're working through something. This is an exegetical question. This is a systematic theology question. Okay, so if that's true, what does that look like? Or another way I'm asking this is, what should you and I be doing? Let's imagine now for your average church member, person who's an adult, but maybe has never taken formal theological training. What kind of things do I need to do for them on these five disciplines to help them ultimately to try to see them grow and become stronger in their faith? So um, here are just, this is, this is kind of stripped down, but my recommendation for us as we help people. Exegesis, help them to learn to read in context. Help them to need, know how to use basic helps. Okay, reading in context because um, I think more often than not, a lot of our people tend to come in and read scripture atomistically. They tend to read the one verse and not read the verses around it. They tend not to read the entire book, read the Bible as one unit, the entire unit. Okay, so helping them do that, helping them to learn how that works and that they need to read the whole text of scripture. Okay, I think that's a good starting point. Um, for biblical theology, give them the basic framework for understanding the entire Bible as the story unfolds. Our people are not reading many times. They're not reading the Old Testament. Why not? Because we haven't told them how that works. We haven't told them how people are saved in the Old Testament. We haven't told them what was the role of the law. We haven't told them what the sacrifices actually accomplished or did or how that fit together. Um, some of them feel like Jesus appears on the scene when I get to Matthew, but that the Old Testament is absent of the Trinity, of, G of, of the second person, of the Godhead, the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we've got to help them see Christ in the Old Testament. We've got to give them the basic framework of the covenants. They should know things like uh, the, the early stages of Genesis, God calling out his people, Exodus, bringing them into the promised land, David, the promises to David, Israel sins, Israel fails, exile, but God brings them back, new covenant. I mean, some of those basic frameworks will really help them understand the Old Testament. And suddenly, you, you can't just accept that, that they won't understand two-thirds of their Bibles. We need to help them understand that whole massive section of their Bible. Systematic theology. Um, my concept here is something I do experientially every semester in Bible doctrines, kind of my, <laughs> just, um, yeah, my annoying motto that I hammer to them is I, I'm, I'm desperate to get this in their brains. When you have a question about God in the world, how do you answer it? And you don't answer it by having a logical framework. You answer it by finding verses. Okay, logical arguments exist. But I want my students, when they hear a random, wild question they've never heard, I want them to go, wait, what are the verses? Okay, I want them to, I'm desperate to get them to think that way. And if I can make their brains work that way, what verses do I know about this question? Then they're going to be far better off. Historical theology, teach them to benefit from theological discussions. What I mean here is related to what I said in exegesis. Um, if you ever hear somebody that says something like, well, I just want to put away everything else, and I just want to read the Bible for myself. What does the Bible mean to me? What did this passage mean to me today? What they're basically doing is just dumping historical theology. Um, they're, they're treating it as though they're the only person on an island, okay? And so one of the, the benefits I think you can give them, help them know that they can use good commentaries, help them know about good theological resources, Historical theology does not assume that the people are dead. Historical theology might exist like right now, a person still alive, still writing. That's historical theology in the sense that 
it's what another voice has said. Okay, so help them find good resources they can use. That is doing historical theology. And then finally, practical theology. Teach them that the most practical answer they can possibly ask for is theology. Here, I'm desperate as well with my students. Any kind of divide they have, well, here's the practical world, and then there's theology. And dividing those off. Well, okay, all right, all right, all right. You talked about theology. Now let's be practical. Um, I, you know, <laughs> I want that thought to be so clearly labeled as broken that they'll never do that again. Okay, I want them to never think that. Okay, well, I heard your theology, but then let's be practical about it. <laughs> theology is practical, and I, I understand what they're saying, and. I, it's not that it's untrue. There is such a thing as having to stop and then ask, so what do I do? Okay, so that's maybe what they mean by let's be practical. But I'm, I'm just absolutely allergic to the notion that theology is not practical. And I'm desperate to make sure that they don't think that in the future. Okay, um, that's it. That's all I'm going to do tonight because that's all I have time to do tonight. When you come back next time, we'll be doing the linguistics lecture. So um, that's because the logic lecture got moved to the end because uh, Dr. Talbert had a third hour. So we moved that lecture. Next time is scripture and words. And uh, you're stuck with me again. Okay, so we'll see you then. Hope that you can definitely take the time to take a look at, um, take a look at the reading assignment that's there because I think that'll make this profitable, more profitable for you. Okay, thank you. Have a good night. Thank you, Dr. Jared. Thank you.